and under 18 U.S.C. Section 241, if two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any citizen in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States, or because of his having so exercised the same day, shall be fined not more than $5,000 and imprisoned not more than 10 years, and shall, moreover, be thereafter ineligible to any office, or place of honor, profit, or trust created by the Constitution or laws of the United States. Actual malice exists when the defendant knowingly commits misconduct, or when engaged in action with reckless disregard, while mere acquiescence or silence or failure of an officer to perform a duty does not make one a participant in a conspiracy unless he acts or fails to act with knowledge of the purpose of the conspiracy, and with the view of protecting and aiding it. At at issue before the court is the proposition that, under Virginia Code Section 18.2-22, a, if any person shall conspire, confederate or combine with another, either within or outside the commonwealth, to commit a felony within the commonwealth, he shall be guilty of a felony. And, under Virginia Code Section 15.2-1627, b, while an attorney of the commonwealth may in his, or her, discretion, prosecute class 1, 2 and 3 misdemeanors, prosecution of felonies is mandatory, but it no person shall be put upon trial for any felony, unless an indictment or presentment shall have first been found or made by a grand jury in a court of competent jurisdiction. No citizen or member of the community is immune from prosecution, in good faith, for his alleged criminal acts, and the imminence of such a prosecution, even though alleged to be unauthorized and, hence, unlawful, is not, alone, ground for relief in equity which exerts its extraordinary powers only to prevent irreparable injury to the plaintiff who seeks its aid. A defendant is presumed to continue his involvement in a conspiracy unless he makes a substantial affirmative showing of withdrawal, abandonment, or defeat of the conspiratorial purpose, and mere cessation of activity in furtherance of the conspiracy is not sufficient to show withdrawal. Under federal law, and in most states, once the conspiracy has been established, the government need show only slight evidence that a particular person was a member of the conspiracy. And it is the rule that all parties to a conspiracy need not be named in the indictment. If the indictment charges a conspiracy among named defendants and other persons unknown to the grand jury, and it appears at the trial that there was such conspiracy but that only one of the named defendants was a member of it, it is sufficient to support a conviction if it is shown by substantial evidence that the parties unknown at the time the indictment was returned committed overt acts therein alleged. Under Virginia law, the elements of a common law civil conspiracy are i. An agreement between two or more persons to, to accomplish an unlawful purpose or to accomplish a lawful purpose by unlawful means, which 3. Results in damage to plaintiff through an overt action done pursuant to the agreement, and there must also be an underlying tort committed. However, although an overt act by itself, whether or not injury ensues, is not a requisite element of a criminal conspiracy violation, but an injury from an overt act is necessary and sufficient to establish civil standing for a conspiracy violation. Moreover, because of the nature of the offense, an agreement often may only be established by circumstantial and indirect evidence including the overt actions of the parties, and, accordingly, proof of an agreement to commit the overall objective of the offense may be established solely by circumstantial evidence. A conspiracy may be established where there is credible, convincing evidence that t. He alleged conspiracy could not have been carried out by only one person. But can a case be made for conspiracy regarding the masking mandates in Arlington Public Schools? Certainly a violation of civil rights would not just be a tortious action in misconduct, but also a felony under federal law, punishable by up to 10 years in prison. While the kind of negligence required to impose criminal liability has been described in different terms, it is uniformly held that it must be shown that a harm was not improbable under the facts as they existed which should reasonably have influenced the conduct of the accused, 
and the negligence must not be so gross as to raise the presumption of malice, it must have been the negligence of the defendant personally, and it must be the proximate cause of the harm. To constitute criminal negligence essential to a conviction, an accused conduct must be of such reckless, wanton or flagrant nature as to indicate a callous disregard for human life and of the probable consequences of the act. The NIOSH, a subordinate regulatory agency under the CDC had published a study over a decade ago, and had that study determined that non-medical grade substitutes for respiratory protection were effective at preventing the spread of any disease, including COVID-19, there would have been no burning necessity for anyone to be debating evolving science. An N95 is a hydrophobic medical device equipped with a respirator that has the capability to filter contaminants measuring 0.30 microns or larger, however, it is only effective against tear gas for about an hour. Considering that the largest SARS COV-2 particle is still six times smaller than the smallest configuration unit for tear gas, would it have been reasonable to mandate non-medical grade facial coverings to mitigate and prevent the spread of COVID-19? The education leaders at the Arlington Public Schools had certainly thought so, but, for unknown reasons, today, are reluctant to publish the details of their plan for implementing masking guidance and what they had hoped to achieve. The CDC, in May 2021, had finally conceded that the primary means of transmission for COVID-19 was through aerosols, or fine particles, which for the SARS-CoV-2 virus measure as small as 0.25 microns, sufficiently small to evade the filters in an N95, and in a sufficient exposure to an infectious dose would facilitate a breakthrough infection against an N95. Would a reasonable person find an extra layer of protection from a substitute device providing less capabilities? The education leadership at the Arlington Public Schools certainly thought so, to the extent that in January 2022 they had brought suit against the Virginia governor to defend their masking mandates. Under Virginia Code Section 15.2-3220, mandamus and prohibition shall lie from the Supreme Court or any circuit court to compel a city or town to carry out the provisions of this article or to forbid any violation of the same. Mandamus is an extraordinary remedy employed to compel a public official to perform a purely ministerial duty imposed upon him by law. To render a mandamus a proper remedy, the officer to whom it is directed must be one to whom, on legal principles, such writ must be directed, and the person applying for it must be without any other specific remedy. Where the question is one of public right, and the object of the mandamus is to procure the enforcement of a public duty, the people are regarded as the real party, and the relator at whose instigation the proceedings are instituted, need not show that he has any legal or special interest in the result, it being sufficient to show that he is a citizen, and as such, interested in the execution of the laws. And, at least for now, even the Commonwealth Attorney for the County of Arlington, during another presidential election year, has elected a right to remain silent even about being served a complaint to compel her to convene a grand jury investigation into the masking mandates imposed on pupils in the Arlington Public Schools, and evidence of flight is admissible even if offered solely to prove his consciousness of guilt as to that predicate act. A finding is clearly erroneous when although there is evidence to support it, the reviewing court on the entire evidence is left with a definite and firm conviction that a mistake has been committed. The ultimate purpose of the judicial process is to determine the truth. A lie is a lie, no matter what its subject, and, if it is in any way relevant to the case, the district attorney has the responsibility and duty to correct what he knows to be false and elicit the truth. We who are seeking truth and not victory, whether right or wrong, have no reason to turn our eyes from any source of light which presents itself. And, I, T is emphatically the duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. This message was approved by Major Mike Webb. Honest. And y'all come back now. You. Yeah.